Mamma Mia! Here we go again! This time, the adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. As we celebrate classic Pride films on... The Real Watch List Plus! Boom. Okay, this week we're doing The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, a 1994 film, a dark comedy kind of road trip, and it's showing this month on Tubi. Let me get a little bit about the plot for the viewing audience. Two drag performers and an older established transgender woman travel across the desert in Australia in a bus named Priscilla to perform their unique style of cabaret. And it's really a campy feel good flick. So Deb, let's shake our groove thing and get right to our costumes. Okay, you go first. Okay, well I'm Agnita from ABBA, who, as you know, sang Mamma Mia uh, in a drag performance in Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Mm -hmm. So I am here celebrating with not only Priscilla, but with ABBA as they celebrate their 50th anniversary winning the Eurovision with their song Waterloo. And this film actually gave it a new revitalization, a new renaissance. When people saw this film, they loved the soundtrack and they loved this song. So here's my tribute to ABBA. And don't forget to flick your blonde hair back so they can see your beautiful I, face, I'm Joe. I'm having problems with this hair. It's I like, know, but you know, you're going to have to suffer through because we have to tell everybody about this movie. Yes. So are and you a leg girl? Well, look at I wanted to show. Look at this thing. Is this I the greatest it. thing in the world that I you ever it. saw? God, I never thought I'd wear it, but it's perfect for this. And I am kind of Abbott out too. Yes. Not Abbott, Abbott out too with a very... Well, if I can keep this on my lap, a very groovy <laughs> outfit. And uh, I love your this, outfit. I, I know. Love, I love I lo pink. So this is great. So, so those are our costumes. We're ready to roll with this film. Yeah. So we really are. Should we? Yes. Let me get my let's, little score here. Yep. Yeah, let's flip off. And <laughs> don't flip me off. No. We'll just flip off the score. Okay. And on the Three, one, two, one, turn. <laughs> What? Wow. Are you kidding me? Wow. Are you kidding me? Well, I know the bus, and what is that other uh, stick figure that looks like Hangman? Well, what is that it's, there? It's, it's, it's someone in drag. I see. Like me today. I hope they look better than that when they go on RuPaul's show. Please, They're not going to do very well. Life right. is a drag, and so is that score, Debbie. I saw this movie years ago, and I just rewatched it in our down and dirty reviewing mode how we do and I was really shocked because Guy Pierce was in it and he was you know I knew Guy Pierce from like LA Confidential mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and from uh, Memento yep. and uh, the remake of uh, Mildred Pierce which actually they filmed in my hometown of Allenhurst New Jersey right. part of it and he was actually he plays Adam and he took the role because he wanted to get out of a soap opera that was very well known in Australia. Yes, if I may, and it was called Neighbors. Neighbors. And he was 26 years old when he took this part and he so desperately wanted to break out of that teen idol uh, image by doing something this so drastically different than what the people of Australia was were watching him as. I tell you, when I first saw this as an older teen, and then later on, I thought Guy Pierce was gay, but really? he's not. No, I mean, I, I so not only did he fool me, but I'm sure a lot of other people. But he really, definitely broke out of a, like that teen idol kind of like heartthrob image. So, plus, he was beautiful. I mean, I was staring at him, going, "What a beautiful woman he is!" It was a drag. drag. He was gorgeous. Yep. And another thing about him is his timing was great mm -hmm. on all the dance numbers and the singing. Yep. He really has a, a style of theatricality besides being a pretty good actor. Yep. So his character name, his drag name, was Felicia Jolly Goodfellow. Mm -hmm. I love drag names. And Hugo Weaving's character, his drag name, Mitzi Del Bra. Again, something that was out of the ordinary for a straight masculine person to perform in the lead role yeah. of this film. Yeah. Matter of fact, they talk about a lot of behind the scenes in a documentary. It's called Between a, a Frock and a Hard Place. So keep that on your list, folks, if you want a little bit behind Frock the scenes. Frock and a Hard Place, wow. But they actually got into drag. They acted the part out in the open public. And Guy Pierce was actually worried that someone would recognize him. They went down to Oxford Street 
the gay section of um, that part of Australia and they were walking around with a bodyguard and Guy Pierce thought, oh my God, someone's gonna recognize me, but no one did. Matter of fact, when they went to the club to go and sort of like, okay, what's this all about being in drag and what's the life all about? Other drag queens were like, who are they? Who are they? they, they they're not from this part of Australia. Like, who are they? So they did such a great job of not only acting, but getting into their parts, breaking away from a traditional role that they were accustomed to and becoming someone new. Well, Hugo Weaving, and I, I, you know, I was shocked to see him in this, and I said, he's the guy from The Matrix, the scary guy from The Matrix. Actually, the character Tick, based on a real person. Yes. An actual drag queen named Cindy Pastel, mm -hmm. who has a son and a female companion, which is what happened with this character, because he was torn between wanting to do what he did as a drag queen, but also kind of leaving a woman that he was married to, and he didn't reveal that to like, I think almost three quarters of the way into the Correct. picture, yep. and a son that he left, but uh, she was uh, like his rock, and she kind of understood it. Right, they had a moment of sexual pleasures, and even though Miss Cindy Pastel, in real life, is gay, drag, but they had a moment of, an intimate moment that they created a child. They had, they, they, and then at, at some point, now in the film, they try to reunite. And Tick wants to bring Bernadette, played by... Terrence Stamp, who love. I had a huge crush on. He made a movie back in the 60s that I want everybody to see called The Collector. And he was obsessed with Samantha Egger. Terrence Stamp was beautiful looking man. He's such a good actor that I kind of forgot he was a guy. Right. And Bernadette is a very soft, a real, a real transgender mm -hmm. in the picture. And uh, he had trouble with the role in the beginning, but then he really got into it. Right. So now Tick has to go across the outback mm -hmm. to get to Alice Springs, where he tells Bernadette, played by... Terrence Stamp. Your, your beau. Yeah, my and, boyfriend, one of my boyfriends right. in film. And Felicia, played by Guy Pierce. Yes. And they, he convinces them to travel across with them because they have a gig in Alex Springs. Right. He doesn't tell them the real reason. Uh, they get in a bus called Priscilla. Yep. And, Look. Look. and we have a Priscilla bus. We have bus. a Priscilla. Make it go. Ooh, there it goes. Across so they're the going across country. There it goes. There, there Through the it. outback. They're in it. So the story then takes off from there where they're. Um, going through the outback and coming across different areas where a miners community, where you have like sort of rough the, the rough and tough arm wrestling, beer swizzling, you know, homophobic, right. crazy men. So they also go from a rough and tumble uh, miners community right. to a group of Aborigines, mm -hmm. uh, the first Australians. Cool. And when I saw the film, it really as an openly gay man now, looking at it, thinking, wow, I, I really thought that movie when I was closeted was something like, oh my God, there's other people out there. They're, yeah. And, and they're, you know, they're going through areas where you, they're meeting homophobic people. Okay. Um, but in a funny, madcap kind of way. Right. Um, which made me feel comfortable. Not your stereotypical, classic gay film where there was anger or constant violence. Yeah, or, or a big like arc of something where somebody had to overcome it and barely com commit suicide or something. It was, it was a madcap fun type of lark right. across the desert. So they're traveling across the outback and when they get to the miners uh, group, they actually come across um, an opportunity to perform. And they get onto the bar and they do shake a groove thing. And as they're performing, the miners are dead silent, except for one person. And that was Bernadette's kind of love interest. They weren't yeah. sure with, with Bob. Um, Bob actually kind of sees her as a woman. Right. You know? Bob mentions that, oh yeah, I, you know, they're talking to Bob and they're expecting this rough and tumble kind of rugged Australian. Uh, but he has like a kind of a, a soft heart. Very soft. And he talks about how he would see lay girls, uh, which was very famous in Australia, yeah. female impersonators, and that he just loved it. And then all of a sudden Bernadette, who's transgender in the film, 
oh my God, maybe I, I've met someone that I can well, really relate to. I think once to. you kind of settle down. Yeah. It's a little long in the tooth. I want to go back to Terrence Stamp for a second, sure. if you don't mind. Go for well, it. Well, Terrence Stamp also for a younger audience was General Zod in the Superman movie. Mm -hmm. He was great too. He looked like a great villain. He was just fantastic because mm -hmm. he's gorgeous looking. Sorry, but he is. He's beautiful. And in the, in, in the day, he was a huge, huge womanizer. Mm -hmm. He went out with Julie Christie for a long time and then she ended up with uh, Warren Beatty. Mm -hmm. And also Gene Shrimpton who Back when we talked about blow up, Gene Shrimpton was the other big model of the day besides right. Verushka. For Bernadette's mm -hmm. role, David Bowie, mm -hmm. John Cleese, mm -hmm. Tim Curry, and Tony Curtis and John Hurt were all considered. But Tony Curtis was considered because of Some Like It Hot, which is probably the best comedy in the world that ever has been. But Tony Curtis didn't want to be typified. He was a little bit feeling that wasn't a good thing mm -hmm. and he thought it would be career suicide. Right, and his wife actually was the one who insisted don't take the role. Right. Because it could be the end of your acting career. Yeah. Um, but Terrence Stamp had a problem trying to get into his role as a transgendered person. He tried to follow models like Jacqueline Bissett, Brooke Shields. He was trying to really study a character and he was having such a difficult time with becoming a woman. Matter of fact, he thought that, oh my God, did I do something wrong? Is this not the role I should be in? Uh, did I make the wrong decision here? I'm the sexiest man alive as awarded. And Many times. Like 10 times man. he was voted the sexiest man alive from the 1960s straight up to, you know, and they actually times. Gave him a drag queen, a tranny trainer, as they said in the documentary, to get him to act more feminine. Right. And if you notice in parts of the film, he would swish his hair. Well, that was actually a training technique that was taught to him. That's why I'm telling you to swish today. I'm trying swish to swish that hair, baby. a hard time. I know. Um, you don't want it to fall off. So, uh, but he, his breakthrough. Um, came at the point where, you know, he, he's having a hard time. Um, Stephen, Stephen Elliott refused to have any mirrors around him, refused to send him dailies, because he did not want yes. him to yeah, look I at himself I did see in that. drag. Yeah. The, he actually went out with a guy and with Hugo in drag out to the club, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And while he felt comfortable, it was getting better, still he was like, oh my God, I, I, I can't do this. I just... You know, when I'm out of this environment, how am I going to be? It was that scene in the miners' community mm -hmm. where they do the routines, shake a groove thing. Yeah. He said it was at that moment when he appears before the crowd, a crowd of actual miners, extras from that town, it clicked. Yeah. He said, you know what? I can do this. I'm fearless. I can do this. And that's when he becomes right. the real Bernadette. And that's Broken Hill, that, that town where it is. Mm -hmm. And I think that... It got so popular that, you know, the thing about Priscilla, and I guess I'll put it in right now because we always say, why should people watch this? Mm -hmm. It's because it's kind of the first movie that went mass market right. about something that if some people felt weird about it after they saw it, they did it. Right. They thought, oh, this is cool. These people have personalities and feelings and concerns mm -hmm. and everybody should get along and everybody should have fun. Right. And in the drag world, they always said within the community that the drag queens were the first ones to go out there because they're fearless. They don't yeah. care what people think. They're going to put themselves out there. And that opened up a lot of eyes, especially for people that are in a closet like myself, like, oh my God, they can do this and with such flair and such, you know, being out there and being themselves. Well, look at what you do now. Look uh, at the way we act. I, I mean, please, you know. My knowledge of drag was Milton Berle, Benny oh, Hill, yeah. Flip Wilson. I mean, that's what I remember. <laughs> and, and they were funny. They were comedic and they were straight. Um, but this movie actually said, wow, there's someone out there that are like this. Right. Um, it also opened my mind cinematically to Australia because the scenes throughout through the outback, the mountains, the desert, uh, when they meet the Aborigines, I, I'm like, wait, I've never seen someone like that. Yeah. I was like, is that someone new? Uh, it opens your eyes up to not only being gay and right. being, you know, happy about it, celebrating it, but to different people, different cultures. 
they spent two million. They grossed over thirty million. Yeah. Critical acclaim. Uh, when Stefan Elliott, the director and writer, put it out there, he originally screened it in the San Francisco area to that a group a of smart place. right to a gay audience. Yes, they hated it. Really, they ridiculed him because they said there wasn't enough uh, male nudity scenes. Well, there you go. They wanted more political discussions, like there's no discussion about like milk, AIDS. milk or something like that. Yeah, you know, there's all no, the heavy duty stuff. Right, they wanted more, like you're not talking about the issues. And yeah. his response is, listen, first of all, if you want to make that kind of film, you spend the money on it. And two, and he's saying this to the crowd, yeah. uh, I'm here not for means of discussing politics, but to show a celebration of life of the LGBTQ plus community. And that was a gaping hole at that time. You didn't have that. You had all these True. like very yeah. like depressing type of Do space you in know how he got the idea for the picture? I do, but I'm gonna let you say it. Okay. Well, I could be wrong because you have certainly studied this, but he watched he, he watched a feather blow mm -hmm. from a drag queen's out outfit down the road in mm -hmm. the desert. And he just thought, how cool is that? It's something beautiful in a stark area. Mm -hmm. And the drag queens represent feathers and dynamism mm -hmm. and beauty. And wouldn't that be cool to just do a road trip? Right. And he wrote the script in 12 days, but he wrote it interviewing a lot of drag queens, um, getting a lot of their lines, their campiness. Mm -hmm. um, the film was filmed in 38 days. And it wasn't filmed chronologically, like many people might think, but actually in films, they do things out of right. sequence and they put it all together. Uh, after the screening in San Francisco, he thought, oh my God, I've ruined it. This film's not gonna go anywhere. He went to the Cannes Film Festival and screened it there, where it was considered like the, the top of this type of filmmaking. Yeah. They applauded, they cheered, they loved this type of film. And it was at that point that he knew he had something. It was considered the darling of the Cannes Film Festival. And mm -hmm. then Polygram, who was getting into the film scene, yeah. uh, decided that they wanted the film. They uh, purchased half the film for nothing, as long as they used the soundtrack, the music library of the Polygram right. music. So you had the hits like I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor. You had ABBA, Mamma Mia. Right. You had um, um, Finally by C.C. Peniston. When I hear those songs, I immediately think of that film. Yeah, and back then even, it, and now things are so fractured up, but soundtrack albums were a really big deal. Mm -hmm. I remember going out and buying, you know, the CD of like, say, Forrest Gump, which had so many great songs on it, you know? We can't leave this discussion without talking about the costumes, because the costumes are what made this film so memorable. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim Chappell and Lizzie Garnier mm -hmm. won an Academy Award, an Oscar for Best Costumes, and they made the costumes on a $5,000 budget, uh, which I thought was incredible. Tim's mother worked at Target and they got a 15% discount. So they talk about the iconic thong costume. Now thong is not what we think as Americans as thong, it's yeah. a flip-flop. So the flip-flop costume, which, is, which still can be seen today in Australia, he made it on a, a, a limited budget and it came out to be like $17 to make that iconic costume uh, for Tick. And do you know that it was the first Oscar to win for costume design that wasn't either a sci-fi a period piece mm. or um, a fantasy. I the first that. one that was a reality film that won best costume. Talking about the costumes, the waddle bloom. I didn't know what a waddle was, but it's a flower. Uh, that scene when they're in Alice Springs doing their performance of Finally, mm -hmm. it's this headdress that was made out of palms. And the palms, they were trying to like find, like they needed 120 just to make one headpiece. Mm -hmm. So they had a connection at a prison um, and they were able to get lifers in prison to make these palms for- Instead the, of the license movie. plates. Exactly, they made <laughs> palms. I thought it was pretty creative, mm -hmm. but they, Tim Chappell talks about this, that because they were on, on such a limited budget, he, just used every single piece of creativity that he could
could possibly have Sometimes to make Sometimes that these... works all the more than if you spend and throw thousands of millions of dollars at something. Right. But you don't get the essence of it. And that's because he really was into it. Right. And, you know, it, it showed. Yeah, he said uh, people from other countries would contact him years, even years after the film was uh, shown, screened, mm -hmm. and how gay men would say, you know, that movie, because of your costumes, because of the, the theme of the movie, helped them come out. Mm -hmm. So it had such an impact within the community. Um, and the last piece of costume that I want to talk about is the scene where Guy Pierce is on Priscilla in the shoe. <laughs> yeah. And he is Felicia Jolly Goodfellow's bus opera costume scene, where he sings the legendary Sempre Libre La Traviata. And it's, it's pretty good, right? I, I was impressed. The, Incredibly impressed. Thank you. So the theme of that costume came from Stefan Elliott's wanting to use the Rolls Royce's piece up front, the right. uh, Spirit of Ecstasy bonnet ornament. So Tim got flowing silver lame, 600 feet of lame from Target. As they were doing the scene, the flowing part, if you saw that, they couldn't get the piece to actually fly up because there was no wind. And the director at the time and one of the stuntmen says, you can't have this because it's gonna get caught. You're gonna, that actor, that stuntman is gonna get yanked off the bus. It was at that point when he took the pair of scissors, he's about to cut it, mm -hmm. that a wind kicked in and they said, go. And the bus goes and all of a sudden they get that incredible scene. Who would even think Target has how many feet of 600 Silver feet LeMay? of I didn't LeMay. even know they carried LeMay. But did you know that Priscilla opened the Summer Olympics in Sydney, Australia, complete no. with a silver shoe on the roof? I didn't know that. Oh, yes. I thought I might teach you a little something that I found out. Um, I was thinking, too, about the rhythm of the dancing, mm -hmm. that Hugo Weaving and uh, Guy Pierce were great, but Bernadette, Terrence Stamp, although I love him, he was always had a rhythm on his songs, pretty much. Yeah, he, had a, he had a little trouble. Um, it's funny, because when he saw the film when it first premiered, he's like, oh my God, I look so ugly. And he was scared that, oh my God, I did something wrong here. Well, the movie finished, everyone got up, and they were just applauding, standing ovation, over and over. They wouldn't stop. You actually see it in that documentary. It was like, all right, we got to get out of here. We got to go, like, drink, because... And it's just a, I such didn't a great see reception. the documentary. Where did you get to see the documentary? YouTube. So if you go on YouTube, there you can go. actually see A Frock in a Hard Place. Check it out. It's got a lot of information. Well, they have to go on YouTube anyway to watch us. And subscribe. So they can just go, like, subscribe. And then they can just go right over and see that documentary, right? Right. And one of the most important pieces of this film is the message at the end when Tick discloses that he has a son and that... He was married, or is married. Yeah. Uh, so without, folks, this is kind of a spoiler, but the theme of acceptance, because he thought his son would not accept him. And so he's dressing straight. He's dressing up as a cowboy. You get that feeling, like, oh my God, this is really awkward. All of a sudden the son goes, do you have a boyfriend? And I was like, oh my God. That touched me the most because I had the same feeling too. I could relate. When I got married to my husband and I was coming out to parts of my family and I remember my cousin had such a hard time telling his kids and they go, oh, you know, do you know, we got an uncle that uh, is someone in the family who's gay and they were naming like all these other people in the family. So no, no, it's Uncle Joe. And I'm like, okay, and? Really, cool. I guess kids are more resilient than totally. we ever think. And even in Italy, when we, when we vacationed there for our honeymoon, the kids loved us. They were calling Thas Uncle, we had a big party. So the, the meaning and the theme of acceptance really. Well, I think what's happened in America, I mean, the gay has the strides that since the 1960s, that people look at people now rather than, and it goes with every culture and every ethnicity too. You just see the people for what they're worth, their personalities. You're gonna dislike somebody if they're rotten and they're mean, but if everybody's nice and friendly and loving, hey, you know, what the heck? So this movie had a lot of positive impact within the LGBT community and worldwide, just as how, how people perceive people who are gay. Um, that's one of the reasons why it was such an important piece at the time, is to break away from the previously previous 
classic gay cinema into something that's more fun and lively. Um, it portrayed people in the LGBT community as positive rather than criminals, rather than, you know, depressed. Um, yeah, rather than hiding behind a tree in Central Park to grab somebody. Right. One of those or, or being a pedophile, you know, yeah, the stereotypical yeah, comments. Yeah. And that's what Australia was going through at that time. You had gay bashing. You had in the late 70s, uh, in Australia, you had in the 70s a movement sort of like Stonewall uh -huh. in the U.S., in New York City, right. where they had police bust in, brutalized a bunch of gay people, tried to throw them in the slammer, and the protests began. And that was their, as they called their Mardi Gras. Yeah. So they have a gay pride called Mardi Gras in recognition of what happened there. Yeah, that's funny. I didn't know about that stuff in Australia. So that's why even when we do classic cinema, we learn so much as well. I mean, I can watch one a zillion movies in my life, but you're always with film learning something. Right. And you can watch a movie 20 times and still learn something from watching it again. Yeah, it's, it just had so many, to me, that's why I rated it a 10, because yeah. it had such an impact, not only me, and I've seen it several times, and every time I see it, I love it, watch it, not only for its impact on the world in its presentation of the LGBT community, but also on the costumes, yeah. on, on the soundtrack, how music is used, to convey a message, um, and the acting. And for the longest time, I thought the three actors, Guy Pierce, Hugo Weaving, Terrence Stamp, I thought they were gay. I actually thought Terrence Stamp, I didn't know it was oh, Terrence please. Stamp. I thought he was transgender, but I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know them as actors. I knew them heart. as people, and I thought, and One thing I want to say about this, and we have Priscilla right here, the bus, yeah. which we held up before. They did this when they were going across the road. This mm -hmm. wasn't any kind of studio or uh, soundstage thing. Right. And they were all on the bus, including the crew. So sometimes it was so close that the crew had to hide underneath all the oh clothes that were all over. And if you can, and really watch it closely, sometimes you can see some of the crew popping really? up in the movie. <laughs> but you have to watch really closely. I'm going to have to do there. that. I have some great news. This year, celebrating its 30th anniversary since it was made, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert will have a sequel. Yeah. Stefan Elliott announced that all three major characters, Terrence Stamp, who is, I think, in his 90s? Yeah, I don't know that Terrence Stamp's going to be in it. Well, he, he's kind of old he's, now. He's committed. Guy Pierce, Hugo Weaving, have all committed to come back for the sequel. And the costume designer, Tim Chappell, he's also coming back. That so be on the lookout for a sequel to Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. I am super excited. I hope they do it right. I'm looking forward to see how they're going to twist it to bring a new audience in, hopefully a new audience that will appreciate the first movie as they will the second movie. Number one, Tu Wong Fu. Thanks for everything, Julie Newmore. Actually, uh, it's a 1995, the same plot, bigger stars, kind of. John Leguizamo, Wesley Snipes, and Patrick Swayze. Mm -hmm. Actually, when it came out, they considered it, some people, a ripoff uh -huh. of Priscilla. Yeah, but nevertheless, I thought, it, I thought it was, but actually... Yeah. But it's but but then you have the other stars and it's kind of cool to see Patrick Swayze again, who's gone gone now. Did Steven Spielberg direct this one? Really? I thought it was Steven Spielberg. No, I f***ed up. Never mind. Take the hell section out. No, I didn't. Deb think, is right again. I didn't think he did. Deb was Where right. Why did I read Steven Deb Spielberg? Right. I read it somewhere. All right, no scrap of that. <laughs> okay, number two. <laughs> Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Yes. You can think what an Angry Inch is. 2001 film. Yes. A genderqueer punk rock mm -hmm. singer from Berlin tours the U.S. with her band. So now we have Australia and we have Germany. Yep. Very cool. Yes. Kinky Boots. Oh, another Kinky Boots. one that became a Broadway show. Very successful. And unless I'm wrong, you could always I'll try. Go ahead. Cindy Lauper. R help write the score in Kinky Boots, and that's about a drag queen mm -hmm. comes to the aid of a man who inherits a shoe factory, which needs a new diverse look. And boy, does he get it! That's yes. from 2005. And number four, 
Paris is Burning. Oh, a yes, documentary. Classic. We're going to switch a little bit into Doc World in mm -hmm. the in the LGBTQ. It's a 1990 chronicle of New York drag scene in the 1980s. That's my watch list. Mm -hmm. All serious films. Got to honor them. It's the month of June. Mm -hmm. And you have anything to add? I love each and every one of them. There you go. So do I do I my job? You did your job. Do you I get an A job? plus there from you the go. real watch so, list. I am so excited by today's sponsor. The History Trust of South Australia is our sponsor today. Wow. We have great news. They found Priscilla. Oh my God. They found the bus after decades not knowing where the bus went. They found it abandoned on a lot that the gentleman, his name was Michael Mannon. Uh, in 2019, he claimed that he found Priscilla the bus and Stefan Elliott, the director, and a lot of others in the History Trust of South Australia, like well, kind of skeptical because they've had these quote sightings before, almost like finding, you know, Bigfoot. Right. But one of the things that was a key element to them determining the authenticity of the bus was that the interior still had um, the a similar interior that the film had. They could see elements of pink on the bus. But the key piece was there was a track inside the bus where the camera would hang to get the inside shots as the bus was moving. Once the director saw that, he knew it was the Priscilla bus. To me, I'm so excited because it just represents so much, not only to me, but worldwide. I'm looking forward to them restoring the bus, but it will cost some money. Matter of fact, it'll cost about $2.2 million. They got a jump start with the South Australian government of a donation of $100,000. And they're accepting donations from the general public, lovers of classic movies. We're gonna encourage people not only to watch the film, but to bring Priscilla back to life. They estimate it'll take about 12 to 18 months to restore it. Uh, in the meantime, they have a fundraising page. Check it out at shoutforgood.com slash fundraiser slash saving the queen. That's their marketing tool, saving the queen, Queen Priscilla. And if you wanna learn more about the History Trust of South Australia and what they have to offer, go to www.history.sa.gov.au slash Priscilla. We're super excited. I can't wait to visit Australia. I'll be donating on behalf of the Real Watch List Plus. It represents so much to not only South Australia, Australia as a, as a country, but worldwide as a major classic movie. And yeah. we're proud to be a part of that on the Real Watch List Plus. So donate. Well, I can't go any higher than 10. No, you certainly can. And the reason I say seven is only because I know that it's a very important film. I enjoyed it, but I would be fine if I never saw it again. Oh, only because oh. there's too many other movies to watch. Oh no. And I do like LGBTQ films, but I have some that I could sit and watch a lot. I think it was a good film. Uh, I, oh, sorry. So Deb, don't worry. Well, I could be a seven. Deb. Beat me up. You could beat me up De later when we change. Deb, don't worry. I will survive. Hey, hey. Mamma mia, boop, 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 boop. Here we go again. Finally, it's happened to me. Right in front of my face, I scored higher than Debbie. Yes, Finally, you did. I did. Yes, you did. I don't care what you do. I hold my score. And out. You can be blue. And out.